Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, and you are invited to attend this flagship conference from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, North America 2019. That is a mouthful and an awesome conference to attend. It's happening November 18th to the 21st in San Diego, California. This conference gathers adopters and technologists from leading open source and cloud native communities. Use the code KCNA changelog19. Once again, KCNA changelog19 to get 10% off registration or check the show notes for a special link to register and also a link to the convince your boss letter. Again, check the show notes for links to learn more and register. Welcome to Go Time, a podcast featuring a diverse panel and special guests discussing cloud infrastructure, distributed systems, microservices, Kubernetes, Docker, oh, and also Go. We record live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Join the community of Slack with us in real time during the show in the Go Time FM channel and go for Slack. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Listen live at changelog.com slash live or subscribe at changelog.com slash go time. And now on to the show. Hello and welcome to Go Time. I'm Matt Raya. Today we're talking generics and picking through this interesting and sometimes controversial issue. I'm joined by John Calhoun. Hello, John. Hey, Matt. I'm joined also by Johnny Borsica. Hello there. And by one and only Ian Lance Taylor. Hello, Ian. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. It's very exciting. Um, you know, we. We all saw you speaking at GopherCon, and actually today the videos went out. So if anyone hasn't seen Ian's talk on this very subject at GopherCon, you probably can watch the video now. Not now, like yeah, in a couple p- hours. <laughs> good point. <laughs> good point. Thanks, John. <laughs> Maybe we could just start the conversation with a little bit about what, what generics are and uh, what that means for Go. And why it's a, also a, a conversation that we have and we hear a lot about again and again from uh, people that look at Go from other programming languages. So who wants to take a stab at first describing generics for anyone not familiar with the subject? Well, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, generics is a kind of programming in which um, you do not specify the types, the exact types of your uh, values at the time that you write the code. Um, you use uh, type parameters, which stand in for the actual types. And then when you actually uh, execute your program or build your program and execute it, then those types are chosen later on. So it lets you write a set of algorithms and data structures that um, can be written and can work independent of the actual types themselves. That's Great. And so, but these are different to just an empty interface, isn't it? There's still compile time checks that happen with these types. That's right. Yes. It's still all statically checked at compile time um, based on the type argument. So would you say it's pretty safe to say that maps and slices are, in a way, just another example of generics? Yes. Maps and slices are absolutely uh, generic types um, in and of themselves. They happen to be built into the language. So when people talk about generics in Go, one way of saying it is they want to be able to write their own versions of maps and slices, not maps and slices themselves, of course, but, you know, other similar data structures or algorithms that apply to those data structures. So some of the painful or rather what folks consider to be painful um, um, to do without the use of generics is basically having to uh, either rely on you know the empty interface and doing you know type uh, conversions and whatnot and then which is you know comes with its own risks and obviously you, you can you can also do some code generation but really like what 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 seems to be uh, um, the problem, <laughs> to put it in, uh, you know, uh, jokingly, but it, it, there's there's obviously folks are coming in from different programming languages and 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 they they're used to being able to do these kinds of things using generics, um, but Go has has from from the start sort of eschewed that 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 way of programming. Uh, I'm I'm if you're if 
to hear like what, what what are your thoughts for why it was sort of uh, left out right what, what the reasoning was for that and why is so important to to actually be thinking about these things and sort of uh, um, looking to bring into the language now well it's left out because it's complicated um it makes the it does um it adds a lot of um you know you have to think pretty hard about how to do the type checking about how to how the program works um, it's also complicated just to specify type parameters and type arguments. Now, I'm hoping that we're minimizing the complexity with our design draft, but um, there's no denying that it will make the language, you know, it adds a number of new concepts to the language. Um, now, that said, uh, the reason people look to see it and go, I mean, as you say, people are familiar with generics from other languages, but um, there's a set of um, a set of programs, a set of kinds of code that we can't really write in Go because we do not have generics. Um, and, you know, we're used to that. Um, and we can still write, obviously, tons of good Go code anyhow. But if we had generics, we could, for example, write libraries um, that provided um, data structures that don't currently exist. A typical example would be a concurrent hash map you know, a hash map which could be modified safely by multiple Go routines simultaneously and was type safe, just like the uh, standard library, I mean, the standard language map type is. Um, another example of uh, would be a set of algorithms that we can't really write today, like algorithms that work with channels um, of any type. Like you could write just simple functions that merge two channels or, uh, you know, multiplex one channel onto a bunch of other channels or did whatever you wanted to do, you know, various kinds of client server architectures written with channels that right now you have to write each one by itself because you can, there's no way of saying, um, I have a channel, but I don't care what the type of the channel is. You always have to say, I've got a chan int, or I've got a chan of, you know, struct something or other. You can't just say, I've just got a channel and I still want to write a select statement on it. That's hard to write in Go today. I think, was it last week? Was it Matt where you guys were talking about the um, io.writer interface and reader interface. Yes. And like this reminds me of that a lot where we can write a lot of really cool code around the fact that those interfaces are very popular and we don't really care about what we're reading from. And it sounds like what you're saying is like with the channels, it's kind of unfortunate that we can't do the same thing with channels, even though there's a lot of common functionality we could have built around that. That's right. Yeah. So one way that generics can help um, Go programmers is to... Uh, as you say, you can write um, you can write interfaces that are very powerful, but you have to write a method that implements those interfaces. You could sort of conceptually think of all the built-in types in Go of having their own methods. They're methods that we they're not written as methods. They're written as you know like the plus sign or the channel receive and send operator. Uh, but there's no way to capture those ideas in an interface, and generics let us um, do that. But generics are also more than interfaces. Uh, you can also write uh, generics that describe the relationships between multiple types. Um, you don't have to always be working with a single type. You could have, um, like a typical example would be a graph which has different node and edge types. You could write general generic graph algorithms that work on types that implement whatever is required um, by those graph algorithms, but you don't have to specify what exactly those types are. So in that case, and I saw that example in your talk, Ian, if you had a graph and a node and these two, you have a, a contract that enca encapsulates both, that contract would only make sense when you provided a type for both of them, wouldn't it? You wouldn't be able, you know what I mean? So the, those types would essentially be required. That's right. You'd have to, for the case of the graph example in the talk, yeah, you'd have to provide two type arguments every time you wanted to work with a graph, one describing the node type and one describing the edge type. That makes sense. And of course, it, the compiler would, if you forgot one of those types or whatever, then of course, the compiler is going to help you at that point, I suppose. Yes, the compiler, you know, it would, it would be as though you called a function without passing enough arguments to the function. So when we talk about like all these different data structures, um, I guess one question I have is, would you see the standard library getting much larger as a result of generics? Um, it's really hard to say. I, I wouldn't see it getting much larger. What I would say is I would expect to see a new chans package, for example, with the channel algorithms I mentioned. And similarly, there would be a new slices package, which would have a bunch of simple slice algorithms that worked on slices of any type. And beyond that, it's really difficult to say. I think that we would become possible for people to write data structures, uh, generic data structures that worked in different ways. 
but most of those would live outside the standard library. I think it would only be as we saw, you know, clear use cases for them that would be uh, desirable to pull them into the standard library. So I wouldn't think the standard library would grow a lot bigger right away. But, you know, of course, there would always be scope for adding new things that have a clear general applicability. I mean, this has come up a lot with like go to is sort of where generics seem to be talked about, even though it might be possible to do this without you know, requiring go to. But I suspect one of the benefits is that there's probably some existing packages in the standard library that we would, at least I would imagine things like the sort package changing if we had generics. Do you see that as also being true or? Yes, I agree. The sort package would change and also the uh, container list uh, package would change and the hash package. Um, those packages would very likely, uh, you know, we'd still keep the old packages around, but there would likely be new versions of them that worked uh, using generic facilities. But we wouldn't get a new sl type kind of slice, would we? That's going to no. likely stay the same. Yeah. Yeah, slices. Slices are good. They're great. There's no reason, uh, no reason to change them. They are great, actually. It's. I do think, like, I look at the sort package, and I, I think it works well, especially once you figure it out. But I, I know from, if you're used to another language and you come and you see the, the sort package, sometimes it can throw you off at first. And it's gotten way better over time. But that's definitely one of the ones that I could see generics actually making Go easier to use. Well, that package actually has one of the cool examples of a way, <clears throat> a way to achieve kind of a generic behavior in Go today, which is where you pass that function and you, you rely on the closure of having access to the data. And the function, you just get the, the, two, uh, in, the indexes of the two items to compare. Um, and so you're doing the work. It's kind of a trick, but it really quite works. Uh, of generics, of course, goes way beyond that. And it was interesting, Ian, uh, something you said really resonated earlier. You said that generics was left out of Go because it's complicated. And I think to developers, to engineers, that concept just really makes sense. And to anyone listening that works on the other side, on the product side of things, that really doesn't make any sense to them at all, in my experience. <laughs> so it's nice to hear that. And also the fact that you you are empowered on the Go team to sort of make these decisions uh, based on a sort of technical reality and mechanical sympathy, they call it, and all that. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think a lot of the success of Go has been that it's that it's simple. You know, I mean, when you're writing a program and you're spending minutes or hours trying to decide which language construct to use in some other language, I mean, then, uh, you know, that's not productive time. Uh, you want you want your language to be a tool that's powerful enough to get everything done, but it's not too hard to use. It's not you don't want to be puzzling over how some aspects of the language work. So you know if we do wind up adding generics to go, that's a property we've got to preserve. That's the most important feature of the language. Yeah, and also the readability. I talk a lot about this um, really writing code for uh, using the APIs and reading the code and optimize for that at the expense of writing, which is why. Personally, I don't mind writing if air equals nil all the time. I'm actually really good at that because when it comes to reading it, which I do far more often, it's very clear and, and expresses it very well. And that is something I like about the latest proposal. Um, if you look at the code, it kind of still looks like Go. Um, although there are, of course, ex there's an additional set of parentheses now that we have to think about. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that because that is one of the things we were really aiming for. It should still look like Go. Yeah, that's a great goal to have, though, I think, as well. And that was actually part of my objection to the try proposal. I digress a little, but I think the try pr proposal kind of had, it, it was a bit, it felt a bit magic and it felt, it didn't feel like the most expressive Go that I um, sort of have become used to. And this, definitely the latest proposal, I think, captures the, Still has the go-ness in it, if that's a thing. <laughs> Good. So when you guys were trying to decide how to make this, you know, readable and easy to use, um, I'm assuming you looked at other languages to try to, you know, get some inspiration to find out things that you thought didn't work. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that process? Uh, sure. Obviously, um, well, maybe not obviously, but the truth is the language that we're most familiar with is C++. So we spent a lot of time looking at the C++ implementation of generics, which of course is called templates in C++. Um, so uh, we knew, I mean, we knew there were aspects of templates that were just going to be hard to bring into a language like Go and that we didn't even want in a language like Go. And C++ 
you can actually you could actually view templates in C++ as another programming language, which is, I, I believe, is actually Turing complete. That's sort of layered over the ordinary C++ language, only uses a completely different syntax, and uh, it's evaluated at compile time. Uh, so that's what people mean when they talk about um, template metaprogramming. You can actually write entire programs in the template language. They're very difficult to understand. Um, but that wasn't a direction we wanted to go. We wanted to sort of hone away all that to just get to the core idea of just being able to uh, use types. Um, we also, of course, looked at the C++ syntax, which many people are familiar with, using angle brackets. We couldn't figure out how to make that work in Go. And um, because, uh, because in Go has the ability that you can parse the syntax without knowing um, the types of the names, uh, you can't, you, in order to fully resolve the program, you have to know the types, but you can actually do all the parsing without knowing the types. And that's not true in C++. When parsing C++, you need to know if something is a template or an ordinary variable. Um, and we needed to preserve the ability to easily parse Go. It makes the compiler faster and it makes it much easier to write a lot of important tools like, you know, Go imports, um, much easier for them to parse the code if they don't need to understand the type of every name. Anyhow, that's, that's kind of where we started from. And of course, we looked at a lot of other languages too. Um, uh, D, uh, Ada, um, Clue. Clue had a lot of these ideas back in the 70s. Um, it's too bad that language uh, hasn't carried forward. And of course, Java. And one thing I like about this is, in some ways, when you're the user of it, it's, it's kind of an optional feature. You might not even know it's there. Um, one of the examples is where it can infer the type from what you've passed in. And so in those cases, you, it looks like you're just calling a normal Go function. So I That's like right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And type inference was actually something we spent a great deal of time on because we knew on the one hand, we really knew that we wanted it so that we could, as you say, people could call a generic function without even necessarily being deeply aware that it was a generic function. But we also had to make type inference rules uh, that didn't surprise people, which again was something we knew from C++. C++ also has overloading and their own um, uh, type deduction, uh, which is uh, very complicated and actually does surprise people sometimes. So it took us a long time to write down a set of rules that were simple enough to apply in most situations, at least. I should say we hope they're simple enough to apply in most situations because the truth is not very much generic code has been written yet since there's no complete implementation. So did you guys write, when you were like thinking about different approaches, did you write partial implementations just to try it out? Yeah. Like I know at this point, I think there's a partial, but I didn't know if that was like the normal for every approach you went with. Yeah, we wrote partial implementations for many of the different approaches we tried. And that's, it, it really helped in finding parsing problems. You know, we'd write, we'd implement it in the parser and we'd try it out with some test cases or, or just writing in the parser. We'd see like, wow, we've just gotten to this case and now we have no idea how to parse this code. So that sort of helped drive us toward the fairly simple syntax uh, that we're uh, suggesting today. That's a really interesting approach, really, because it's like thinking of it because of the fact that you have to parse this language. So that being a primary concern, of course, it's not something we really think about from the outside. When we think about the design of generics, we almost feel like, well, we can be anything. We could just, anything we can type into a notepad. But of course, there's also a sympathy to be had with the existing tools and existing parsers and all that stuff. I did see there is, I think it's the contracts is, is implemented in the parsers. There's a PR for That's it. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, Robert Griesmer has written, um, has written a parser and um, most of a type checker at this point. Uh, so that work is going really well. So that's exciting. What's up, Gophers? It's not too late. If you're planning to attend KubeCon Cloud Native Con here in North America later this November, know that we have just entered late registration pricing, but you can still save 10% off your registration when you use our code KCNAChangeLog19. Again, that's KCNAChangeLog19. Check the show notes for links to learn more and register. Is 
is uh, is that the uh, only new sort of uh, um, very visible, other than sort of the, the concept, right, being implemented in the language? Is that the, the new sort of a keyword sort of being introduced? Uh, that's going to be sort of the, the very first thing sort of uh, developers um, sort of uh, um, um, realize, okay, now generics has learned it because I can use this particular keyword. Like, is that is that like the only one that's, that's uh, um, sort of uh, surfacing at the moment? Yeah. That's right. One new keyword, um, contract. In the current design, that's, uh, that's all we're adding. Um, and uh, you know, you're right. That's the first thing developers are, are going to see. But um, the truth is, I don't think, I, I don't think contracts are going to be the first thing most people reach for. I think contracts are a key element of the, of the uh, design that we're suggesting. But um, you can write a lot of generic code actually without contracts. I mean, at some point you're going to need contracts. I think we do need them in there, but uh, you can actually uh, go to go pretty far just writing um, type parameters and type arguments without contracts. So what would be, the, do you mean using like the existing contracts, the built-in ones? Like No, I mean like just writing code with no contract at all, like like the channel algorithms I mentioned. You know, you can write a lot of things with a channel, a channel of some type T. You really don't care anything about that type T. So you don't need a contract for it. I see. So that's almost like you can, and then any type can be passed in there. That's right. Exactly. Huh. Yeah. Well, actually, I think a lot of the a lot of the classic problems that this that will be immediately solved once generics is available, and and hopefully it's solved in the standard library. And actually, something I'd I'd like to talk about in a minute is um, first of all how how's the community contributed, but also I'm quite interested in how do we how do we not all go off and build our own libraries that are all the common things that everyone's going to need? How do we rally around a central place for that? Um, it'd be quite an interesting, you know, be, hopefully these, all the things we need, the common ones, sets, and, you know, the other types of uh, the graph structures and, and trees and all this stuff. Do we expect them to live inside the standard library or do we think that somebody outside is going to make them first? I think those are great questions, and I don't know. I don't know how that's going to play out. I think, I mean, a lot of things I hope are going to come outside first and then in. But then, as you say, there are some very obvious ones like sets that it does seem to make sense just to add them from the start. I, I, don't, I don't really know how it's going to work out. I don't have an idea there. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, sync map is is one example you raised, which would be great to have a typed sync map, for example, just out of the exactly. box. I mean, yeah, because when you hit the ground running in Go, usually concurrency is something that you're really excited to play around with because of the language primitives that make it possible. Uh, so I know a lot of people get very excited about that area of Go and to be able to just use like the sync map or whatever in a very sort of intuitive, simple way, I think that's going to just help with that. With that, that's the place where I'm excited for new developers to be exposed to this. Because by and large, I think this is going to be a feature, at least for those writing, for more advanced, um, more seasoned developers. I think, and I think junior developers would likely stay stay away a little bit initially. I don't know how you all feel about that. I mean, I think it's. At least in my opinion, I'd, I'd kind of hope that it's one of those things that if you don't need it, you don't necessarily have to run into it. I mean, that's kind of the hope, because if you're not writing the libraries that are, you know, providing generic implementations, and you're just using something like, you know, like maps and slices as they are now, you don't really have to think about the fact that they are generic. And I think if, if that's the case, that at least that's my opinion, that I hope that it won't scare them away right away. Yeah, well, one of the one of the big programming sins that I see uh, uh, still, and I'm also guilty of this as well, is early abstraction. And uh, you know, I always, uh, whenever I see a concept emerging, I'm very tempted to immediately build the abstraction, and I sort of resist that nowadays. I've learned to implement it a few times first, and then look at where an abstraction comes. So with the power of generics, that's definitely an area where we, we might see people reaching a little bit too early for those abstractions. It's going, to be too, it's going to be very tempting. So that's just something I think that we have to talk about as a community. Um, and speaking of the community, well, first of all, anyone, any thoughts on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I mean, new things do tend to get overused. I think the same thing happened with channels in the very early days of Go. I think it took us a while to understand 
where channels really are helpful and where they, uh, you know, where they're a little too, uh, I don't know, where they introduce a little too much complexity or a little too much early abstraction, as you say. We're just going to have to try and learn and hopefully build a good and simple base that we can learn on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. I was I was one of those early adopters that abused channels. I'd used them in all kinds <laughs> of places where I definitely shouldn't have. And and actually now I sort of start with the uh, usually just a mutex. I'll start there and and manage things like that. And sometimes I never have to grow beyond that actually. But yeah, I, I remember that where I mean, it's just so it is so good that we, and we take it for granted now that we can so easily spin up all these Go routines, have them communicating in a safe way, and just use these language primitives to do things like that. It's extremely powerful. So, yeah, I can see why people get excited and want to use it. Yep. On the community aspect, how much of the community have already contributed to generics? Uh, I know there was, there's always big conversation whenever, whenever you start to talk about any features or any changes to the language. And I think that's a testament, by the way, to some of the core values of the Go team, which is the simplicity. I mean, the community is kind of resistant to change and a little bit allergic to it. So how did you find that community engagement, Ian? And was it, was it all you wish it should be? Is there ways we can improve? How was it? Um, I think it's been really good. Um, I think we've taken a lot of ideas from the community over the years. Of course, the generics discussion has been going on, you know, since Go started. Um, a lot of people have uh, contributed really interesting and useful ideas along the way. Um, and there's also been people who've said, you know, no generics, can't take them too much. Um, and, you know, I respect that point of view too. Um, and it just, you know, of course, I'm talking about generics, but I'm, there's no guarantee they'll go into the language at this point. I hope they will. Um, but I think that, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the years. There's been a lot of um different ideas, different approaches taken. And I think it's really helped to inform us um, how we can approach the problem and uh, what we could do with the problem. It's also really helped us to see examples of code that really would be easier um, if uh, generics had been available when that code was written and um, to make sure that um, any design we come up with is powerful enough to uh, implement those problems. So, I mean, so yeah, so let me try to say, so that's the most useful thing we've seen. Examples where generics would have helped and where we can uh, make sure that our proposal really does help. And then, you know, there's been great ideas on syntax, on, um, you know, semantics. And, uh, and a lot of the ideas have been complicated, but I think that they've kind of helped us hone in on kind of a common core of functionality and power that uh, will make this a useful uh, addition to the language. I think it was in the last year or two. Maybe it was longer. It could have been. Um, but I remember reading one of the, I think it was somebody from the Google team actually had a good example of where using the empty interface was actually causing performance issues and generics would have helped. But it seemed like it really took us a while to actually get to the point where people could provide real examples of when that happened. Is that true or am I just missing examples? No, I think you're absolutely right. It takes a while to understand, of course, these things. It takes a while to understand any language. It takes a while to understand the performance implications of, inter of interfaces, of empty interfaces. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. So do you think that's part of the reason that, like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but it feels like generics are getting more of a focus now. And I, I would imagine that part of that might be that you're actually seeing examples where it makes more sense, whereas in the past it was kind of like this would be nice, but it's not important enough to prioritize it. I think there's some aspect to it, to what you say, yeah. But I think that another part of the reason why generics is uh, getting more focused now is that we're actually getting to a point where we think we have a handle on the problem. Uh, I mean, I'm, of course, most people have been using Go very happily for many years. I've been thinking about generics for many years, and um, some of the earlier proposals have been published, and they were all terrible. And then there were a bunch uh, that were not published, and they were even worse. So... Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I think that what we've, I mean, there, there there have been several unpublished proposals that I just sort of would write up and think about and I would share just, you know, just to a couple of people like to Robert and Russ and they would say, you know, well, this is, this is pretty bad. And, uh, and I think that what's happened is we finally gotten to the point 
um, you know, with a lot of help from a lot of people to something which, where the immediate reaction is not, this is pretty bad, but the immediate reaction is, yeah, maybe, maybe we can get this to something that will really work. Given that some of the um, um, the concerns around introducing um, generics and, and the complexity that, that it brings in tow, um, the do you think that, that sort of the current proposal is has reached a point where it, it doesn't introduce too much of that complexity, too much of the burden on the user of, of, of these constructs to be able to sort of uh, uh, keep go, feeling like go, like not introducing that, that original complexity that, that you, you know, I think we're all trying very hard not to not to let, uh, sort of uh, um, get into go? Do you, do you think that the current proposal um, um, meets that standard? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you've asked the essential question. Um, and we need to we need to answer that question as a whole community. So me personally, yeah, my answer is yes. I think we have reached that balance, but you know, I'm not the decider here. Um, we've got to get to the point where we have an implementation where people can try it out, and then we have to see what a lot of people think. I, I think the implementation is a huge part there because I know just looking at it, it's like okay, this looks okay, but it's one of those things until you kind of dive in, you don't know you know, what, what it's actually going to feel like and if it's going to be just instinctive. Because some things look simple from the outside and then they're not, and other things look complex. And then when you get involved with them, you're like, oh, this is actually pretty simple. Yeah, I agree. So uh, our uh, community Slack channel is all a fizz. Uh, people listening live asking questions. And uh, Marwan asks, uh, how much slower will Go builds be anticipated to get? And is are there any... Uh, goals around that. Dylan uh, Baruch Barak follows up uh, by saying he would be happy with 50 to 100 percent and no more, Ian, if that's, <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, goal builds that do not use generics should not be affected at all. Um, okay. Second, let me say that... Um, oh, sorry, Ian, Ian do, you mean, do you mean writing generic code or even consuming generic code? I mean, even consuming generic code. So if you're, I mean, okay. if you, an ordinary, Go, an existing Go program obviously doesn't use any generic code. The existing Go program is not going to be any slower because generics are going to add it to the language. Um, but, uh, but then um, the current design actually envisions a few different compilation strategies. And uh, we expect that when it, you know, if it actually gets added to the language, the compiler is we're going to have to experiment with the compiler choosing different strategies for different kinds of cases. Um, so one strategy would be, you know, the slow version where we really do uh, recompile everything for each separate type argument. And I don't see a reason to use that strategy in most cases. Um, then there's a strategy of kind of approaching it more like it's more like the way interfaces are implemented today, but not the same because we don't want to have the same allocation requirements that interfaces have, but sort of to class type arguments in different, you know, you can describe each type in terms of, you know, at the simplest level, how many pointers it has. And so you can recompile each, um, each generic function uh, based on type arguments with different sets of pointers. Um, and then if you, if you do instantiate with a very large type argument, yeah, maybe you do a special case for that, but that's not going to happen very often. So in that case, you'd compile each generic function, say, you know, four times or eight times. But, you know, that doesn't mean that your compile is eight times slower because most functions are not generic functions. Um, so that's just an example of a couple of uh, compilation strategies you could use. So, um, you know, I would say that if the compiler got 100% slower, that would be a failure. We do not want to be that much slower. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we could pursue generics if we really cost that much compile time for sort of ordinary programs. I mean, clearly you're going to be able to write, you know, kind of torture programs that make the compiler much slower. There's no denying that. But, um, but the, the ordinary case... <laughs> the ordinary case should not be uh, should not be 100% slower. I would hope for say 25% slower. I mean, I'm just making that up because we're a long way from a serious implementation. 
Okay, we won't hold you to it, Ian, but yeah, no, it's interesting. Well, it's funny to hear about all the different things you have to think about, of course, when when it comes to adding a feature to the language. Like I said, we, from the outside, often just think of it as the syntax, and that's it. Um, but of course, there's lots more to it. And I wonder also, actually, uh, Nathan Youngman in Slack mentioned, it doesn't say how old he is, um, it mentions that um, the there might be more or asks rather might there be compiler optimizations that could happen as well between interfaces and generics if we do end up with something that runs or performs better that's an interesting idea uh, that's an yeah that's an interesting idea i had not thought about it and i do not know cool me too This episode is brought to you by GoCD. With native integrations for Kubernetes and a Helm chart to quickly get started, GoCD is an easy choice for cloud native teams. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale build infrastructure on the fly for you. GoCD installs as a Kubernetes native application, which allows for ease of operations, easily upgrade and maintain GoCD using Helm, scale your build infrastructure elastically with a new elastic agent that uses Kubernetes conventions to dynamically scale GoCD agents. GoCD also has first-class integration with Docker registries, easily compose, track, and visualize deployments on Kubernetes. Learn more and get started at gocd.org slash Kubernetes. Again, gocd.org slash Kubernetes. It's really interesting to hear the like the discussions around compilation times and things like that, like Matt said, because it's just there are certain aspects that I would never think about because I don't tend to work on projects where compilation time, like you could literally 10x my compilation time and it wouldn't matter. And there are other people who are definitely not in that case, but just I, I can imagine implementing this and, and bringing about new features has got to be very, very complicated as a result of that. John, do, do you write unit tests? Yeah. So if okay. we 10x... Yes, if, okay. if they went slower, but it still wouldn't be that much. Yeah, like, actually, I, I just might not like run them every time I changed a couple lines of code and said I might just like sort of run you know more specific things, but it still wouldn't be... I don't think it would be that much of an impact for me. Yeah. It's amazing, actually, that we, we do... St I mean, I, when I hit save, I do, I do build and run the tests, and just if there's a failing test, I show it in the, in the IDE. Just having that fast compile time in Go, it's something that was there kind of from the beginning and it's been up and down, but um, it's another thing I think we take for granted, <laughs> but we would, we would miss it if it was gone. Yeah, any, any noticeable impact on, on compile time, um, yeah, I think, you know, as Ian sort of uh, um, um, saying, that would be, would be considered sort of a, a, a big hit, right, um, for, for the language and, and for the compiler and for your workflow, developer workflow, right? So I don't want to have to think about, oh, if I'm using generics, and then my, 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 my workflow is going to be impacted by that, right? That, that, I, think that's, I don't think that's something anybody wants. Yeah, and it sounds like it, it, the, that is in their minds, and that's... I agree. Yeah, I think that is it is important. The other thing, of course, is it, you know I hear a lot of people they avoid using defer because defer has a kind of somewhat you know small performance hit, and then I find out about the case that they're using it in, and there's no way it's going to make the slightest bit of difference. Um, people ca do get a little bit, I think, obsessed with well, can I shave off every little bit of performance out of something? Um, and, and actually readability, you know, what about the performance of you as a developer fixing that code later? That, what about that performance? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. On the defer front, though, since you mentioned it, I'll plug that in 114, I think defers are going to really be a lot cheaper. There's Ooh. some active work going on in that area. I've not been paying for mine already. Should I have been paying somebody every time I use defer? I almost <laughs> would, by the way, because it's that good. <laughs> It's my favorite Go keyword for sure. But yeah, that's, cool. that's exciting. See, I, that's what I love is while we, you know, while the Go team are working on making the standard library better, making the compiler tools and all that better, uh, we can, without doing anything, just sort of reap all those benefits. I really kind of love the fact that um, you're all working on that stuff on our behalf so hard. So thanks for that for sure. 
Well, you're welcome. But you know, a lot of the stuff is not coming from the GO team. A lot of improvements are coming from uh, other people as well. It's uh, we're uh, we're doing a lot of coordination, but a lot of the work is coming from outside. So thanks to everybody. That's, That's great to hear. Pretty cool. And and the other thing too is that there's no. I don't think there's anything sort of driving um, sort of the, the usage of that sort of the, the versioning, right? The nomenclature around sort of go to like, I think the, the, the changes being introduced with, you know, the contracts um, and sort of uh, um, generics is backwards compatible, right? And basically still keeping the go on promise that your stuff is still going to work. And I think that's just amazing. Mm. Yeah, that's a big goal of ours. So that means it could go into a go one of the upcoming Go releases. It doesn't have to wait for Go2 then. Um, yeah, Go2 is uh, more of a, uh, a conceptual idea at this point, I think. Um, I think we're going to try to be as Go1 compatible as we can um, going forward. You know, If we have to break something, then we can break something. But we're going to try not to. And so you know, maybe at some point, maybe after... Uh, Maybe if generics lands, you know, maybe if we uh, get more error handling improvements in, maybe once modules are set, maybe we'll call it GoTo. You know, it might be a good marketing move, might sound good, might give people another reason to look at the language, but it doesn't mean that Go1 programs are going to stop working. I mean, the example I like to use is that, you know, you write a C program, not literally from 1970, but a C program from about 1980. It still runs today. There's never been a C2. So uh, why not emulate that? It's a great successful language. Yeah, well, absolutely. In fact, I like the idea that this go to could even have things removed. Um, but of course, that would then mean breaking changes. But those are the sorts of break breaking changes I like to see is when we make things even simpler. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Like removing panic, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remove global words. state. <laughs> you guys are getting real greedy. Yeah. Just randomize global state. You know how they had to introduce random to the map because people were abusing it. <laughs> By the way, I will. I just abuse it now to get random things now, but I'm abusing it in a different way. Um, yeah, it'll just be the same. I don't know. So, I one of the questions I have is. So we've talked a little bit about how like this is going to change the language, and we've talked about how the community people when they come to go they want to use channels a lot, even though it's not the right tool. Um, one of the concerns I would definitely have, and I think a lot of people will have, is that the minute we have generics, people are going to want to use them, so they're going to write these libraries that are you know generic implementations of data structures or whatever else, and. I think one of the things that the Go community is good about right now is not importing stuff all the time. Like they'll write something on their own. But if we have generics, do you think that's going to affect that mindset some? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a good question. I guess I don't know. But what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's, we're gonna, we, we already have a, a space where we need to have a way to be able to talk about like the quality of packages there's a there's a few good talks i've seen uh julie q did a talk about how to select dependencies in a sort of um conscious way rather than just take anything from anywhere but have a look at the projects see if they seem robust see if they seem used are there tests you know that how does the api look how are the docs all that just sort of taking all of that into account that is going to be more important because it'd be it's going to be too tempting, I think, once if generics got into the language, it's going to be tempting. We're going to see a big spring up of libraries doing all kinds of awesome things. And we're going to then have a sort of abundance of this to sort of sift through. And we that's a general problem, I think, that we still have anyway in the community is knowing which are the which are the dependencies we can trust and which are, which are just more sort of playgroundy type projects that we shouldn't be importing and having as a, as a dependency on our production code that's something i think the community is gonna sort of uh, um, work out like sort of naturally um i i think you know a lot of the 
early practices um, that we've mentioned on, on this this uh, um, podcast alone, you know, in the early days, you know, the abuse of <laughs> channels, for example, you know, the sort of uh, jumping into concurrency and using all the bits and pieces you can, whether your program need, needs it or not. Like a lot of these sort of things, we've sort of worked it out uh, of our system, so to speak. And there, you know, there's enough sort of a... Um, material out there so, so to sort of educate right uh, you know try to do this avoid doing that you know for reason x y and z like over the years we've sort of developed um, um basically what we call idiomatic go right basically to to sort of uh, adopt certain approaches and i think yes in the beginning i think you're going to see an explosion of things that are, that are using the you know contracts and using sort of the everything all the bells and whistles that that generics offer but i think you're going to see sort of a settling down right um, once we've uh, shot ourselves in the foot enough times uh, to basically say okay well like this, this is now basically part of idiomatic go as as all gophers understand it kind of thing um but what i am what i am concerned a little bit about is sort of um um, uh, newbies, folks that are either coming from um, different languages or that are learning um, programming for the very first time, um, and they happen to be using Go to, to do so. Um, basically, how how to teach that concept because it, it requires it requires that you sort of uh, um, really think uh, about different things and sort of multiple layers, so to speak, um, to really understand where is this useful i think the the uh, on the go blog the why generics um post does a pretty good job of sort of uh, introducing okay these are these this is how you would do it today right you have to have you know like a reverse for for string like a you know, reverse for integers and and this is how generic can help you sort of uh, remove some of that boilerplate right so these kinds of things are going to be uh, critical for for teaching people how to uh, um, properly use these language features and i think that's going to happen sort of naturally i guess like for me, one of the examples I kind of think of is all of the routers and like web frameworks and things like that that have sprung up around Go. And like, I think it would be nice if there was something like, like there's the Gorilla Toolkit that has all these different web tools that you can use. Um, at this point, I think it's safe to say that they're all well battle tested. They're all pretty good, you know, things to use. Um, and having that for generics and some data structures, I think would be useful. But I also worry that you might get this case where we have 20 different implementations, like we have 20 different routers that are all benchmarking against each other and just focusing on the wrong details. Um, so like that's, on one hand, I, I do really hope the community figures it out and we you know come up with some sort of consensus, but I also see how we are on other fronts and I'm like, I'm not 100% confident that that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's not really a problem with generics, I suppose. That's a community No, that's like problem. a community thing. Yeah. I just, I hope it's not worse with generics because... I like you know with with routers you'd think there's really not that much you can make different like yeah. there's really not but then like with data structures there's Somehow. a lot of different things you can change <laughs> yeah true we'll just have to see I think um, mm -hmm. but at least see one of the things one of the pieces of advice I like to give and this is this is so uh, almost a, an unofficial test that we can apply to any any suggestion of a change actually is I'll tell people like somebody talked about the the, the the confusion they had between arrays and slices and i'd say well just learn slices for now and then you can be productive and then later you can figure out what's going on and how it works under the hood when you need it and it's kind of like just in time learning it's sort of the best time to learn it as well because you have all the context of why you need to know it so i'll tell people well just don't worry about it and if you can say don't worry about it and and generics the, the latest proposal definitely passes this test don't worry about it um, like you say, a few cases when reading the docs, you're going to see these generic functions. They're going to look a little bit different. Um, so you'll have to know how to invoke them. But uh, especially the case where it's in, the, the type is inferred, where you can just sort of almost ignore that it's even generic in the first place. That It, it has that going for it. And so I think that that will help for sure with this. I certainly hope so. So do you think we could make tools as a community that would make that more likely to happen. Um, I guess what I'm kind of thinking is, Matt, you had mentioned like you don't want to early optimize. You don't want to, uh, you know, try to make something a generic implementation before you've even written it once. So if we had tools that made it very easy to take like a, um, you know, you wrote like a tree that was self-balancing tree, and like we had some way to easily turn that into a generic implementation after we've written a specific implementation for a specific type. Like, could tools like that help the community sort of stay on track and not? do that early optimization? Well, that's an interesting idea. I mean, that tool would be pretty easy to write, I think. Uh, whether people would find it helpful? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. John, maybe you could contribute <laughs> it. 
See, Ian says it'll be easy to write. I suspect it'll be much easier for him to write than for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I probably would bet on that being the case. But yeah, I was also thinking about handlers and HTTP and, and what might happen there even with, uh, and also like um, context. I don't know if that, it, it, whether we're going to see methods that will have a generic flavor to them like the value stuff that's i don't i don't know if that'll mm. even work would it be able to just have a method that's generic within a type that isn't or um i suppose so, in, right? in the current in the... design draft no that's not permitted um and the reason for that is because it adds all this um it makes it more confusing to understand when uh the type with the generic method implements an interface or possibly a generic interface um so we kind of got stuck on a lot of confusing issues there. And we just said, you know, it's not necessary because you can always write a generic function instead. So we're just going to leave out methods. Maybe it's not impossible that they could be added to the language in the future if we do understand it. But I don't think they're going to be in the first version. I did have one question. I know, like in one of the examples, you had a contract that was like the numeric value or something like that, where it's basically all the different you know, integer types and different numbers. I assume for things like that, that sometimes looking at zero values is useful. Uh, do you see that? I guess what I'm kind of wondering is like, how do you do comparisons with constant values like that? Is that just going to change the way the compiler looks at that? Or, you know, is there going to be something special there? Um, no, I mean, again, it goes back to the different compilation strategies that you can use. I mean, there's a couple of different ways that the compiler could handle it. I mean, from a language perspective, I think it's pretty straightforward. You know, if it, if all the types that the uh, contract permits permit a comparison with zero, then you can write a comparison with zero. Um, as to how exactly that's going to be compiled, um, it could be, you know, there's going to be a limited number of types. Maybe you compile it for each type, or uh, maybe you do a more... Um, you know, a sort of a method-like approach where you effectively pass in, here's how you compare to zero. I'm not sure what the best solution is going to be at compile time. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you so much to our special guest, Ian Lance Taylor, who is working on the generics proposals. And uh, Ian doing a great job, I think. I especially do like the latest proposal. If you haven't seen it, check it out it's all over the internet and Ian's talk is also now available if you search for GopherCon um, GopherCon Generics 2019 you'll find Ian's talk and Johnny's talk too uh, and mine but it would be crass <laughs> it would be crass of me to plug my own one <laughs> Matt's so, never done something like that <laughs> it's not my style it's not my style but my book is still available <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you very much as well to uh, my other uh, panelists, John Calhoun, Johnny Borsico. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much. Until next time, goodbye. All right, thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Go Time. If you're not yet, hang with us in Go for Slack. We have a channel called Go Time FM. Look it up, you'll find us. Hang with us during the live shows, connect with other members of the community, share stories, share code, share coffee recipes, whatever. It's a lot of fun. Also, we have discussions at changelaw.com on every episode. Head to changelaw.com slash go time, find this episode and discuss it with the community. Also, thanks to Fast, the, our bandwidth partner, Rollbar for helping us move fast and fix things, and Linode for hosting the Changelaw platform. Our music is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. And if you want to hear more awesome podcasts like this, subscribe to our master feed. It's one feed to rule them all, plus some extras that only hit the master feed. Head to changelaw.com slash master or search for changelawmaster in your podcast client. You'll find us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.